Father God, we come before you this morning. We come with open hearts. We come with an attitude of worship. We come with a desire to just lift you up and glorify you by studying your word, recognizing that it is your word. And Lord, just speak to us this morning as we come and seek to glorify you and your son, Jesus Christ, in whose Lord's name we pray. Amen. All right, well, we're going to continue uh, in Second Thessalonians. If you've been following uh, with me, with us, we're going to pick it up in chapter 2, verse 9 through 12. And uh, <clears throat> we've been talking about this lawless one or the Antichrist for oh, a couple of sessions now. And uh, we're going to continue that and look at a different aspect that Paul or God shares with us in 2 Thessalonians that I think is important, especially as the time draws near, as the time draws near. Uh, so we're not caught off guard. And so that we are prepared as an individual and also as a body of Christ for what's about to happen. I want to now bring you to verse 9. I want to read 9 and 10. Um, remember, chapter 2 speaks an awful lot about the coming of Christ, and we look forward to that. We look forward to that strongly. We see that in verse 1 and verse 7, the coming of Christ, the parousia of Christ, the Greek word for a coming. Uh, but chapter 2 also talks about um, the coming of the lawless one, the coming of the lawless one. And, and remember, this is an important chapter because it speaks of the coming of Christ being preceded by two events, the falling away, the apostasia of, of the, I believe, the church or the believers or non-believers walking away, but also the Antichrist will be made known, which means believers will see the Antichrist. And I know there's a lot of people that don't agree, but this is a difficult verse and passage in verse 3 to cope with if you think that's not true. But we're going to talk also about the coming of the Antichrist. In verse 4, it spoke of him sitting in the temple of God as God, proclaiming to be God. That's a key point. Don't forget that one as we go along. Currently, we spoke that he is now restrained. Now restrained. It's hard to believe in the world we live in today that he would be restrained with the amount of evil we see and the amount of sin that seems to be exploding, uh, not only in our, in our country, but worldwide. Can it get worse? Absolutely it will. We're told that when the restrainer is lifted, Satan will be allowed to do pretty much anything he wants. And he will come, as we will see today, with all power. With all power. We'll explore that today. What does that mean? So let's begin by reading verses 9 and verses 10. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they may, might be saved. Powerful verse that speaks clearly of what's about to happen and what's going to come. The restraints are lifted. The lawless one will be revealed. He'll be made known. He'll make his entrance into our world that be unmistakable. Unmistakable. It won't happen in some corner of the planet that we don't know about. Now, the Antichrist very well and could be alive today as a human being, but he's not empowered yet by Satan because we'd know it. We'd know it, and as believers, we will know it. It'll become so obvious he'll be empowered by Satan, according to the working of Satan himself. Now, that's a name we use uh, for the devil um, the name we've given is masculine singular word. Satan is used 34 times in the New Testament to describe the evil one, known for his evilness. So whatever this lawless one, this antichrist, when he comes, he'll be doing the work 
of Satan here on planet Earth uh, in the last days, in the last days. Revelation 13, 2 says that the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. We learn and see in Revelation 12, verse 9, who that dragon is. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. Right there, he deceives. Key point when it comes to end times. He will be the great deceiver. All the way back to the Garden of Eden, where we see him disguised as a serpent. Satan is not really a serpent. So as much as you may or may not like snakes, uh, they are not Satan. Satan just knows how to disguise himself in a way. The serpent said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Right from the get-go, deception, lies, not a truth teller. Satan will do anything to make life miserable for man, to attack God in his image. He was on, at his best back in the garden. He's still at it today. And he will go after the entire world. And he does, in fact, indwell beings. Satan himself is a spirit. He's, he's a spirit. And here we have an example of him indwelling an animal, I guess, serpent. But he's also indwelt people. He's indwelt people. And if we look at Judas at the first coming of Christ, we have this almost alarming verse because we wonder why would God even allow Satan, the one he kicked out of heaven, to, to uh, enter a person. But here it's clearly said, then Satan entered Judas, named Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. Not only did he enter a person, he entered the close inner circle of Christ. But he entered him to do his work. At that time, it was to betray him and hand him over to the Pharisees and the Jewish people and the Roman government to crucify Jesus Christ. Will he indwell the Antichrist? Is there a person around living in the world today that Satan has got his mark on and that intends to dwell in the same way? It seems reasonable to think that way seems scary to think that way. But God is going to allow Satan to do his will, and he will use a person, he will use a man, to be his representative here on planet Earth, to do his evil, his lawlessness, as it says. And Satan will do anything, pull out all stops, everything in his power to deceive the world. It's a moment in time that he's been waiting for for centuries and millennium to claim, put his claim on the earth. He's been held back, but that power, that time will come and all wickedness and all evil will be unleashed in a way we can only imagine at this point. But as believers, we need to be prepared. People often say, why are you studying Satan and the Antichrist? Because we want to be prepared. We're looking forward to the return of Christ, but certain. He is our Savior. He is our end, and we do look forward to him. But we do know this event has to happen first. Satan will use everything in his power. We see that in, in that verse. You look at verse 9. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power. I don't want to just glance over that verse slowly, but quickly, I mean. But this power is a real power. It's not some magic game. God is going to allow Satan to have real power supernatural power beyond any power that we've ever seen on this planet from such an evil person. And so it won't just be the appearance, it'll be real. God gave us an insight into how this can happen in Job. 
And I'm just going to share with you a couple of things from Job to give you a sense of what kind of power Satan can actually have at that time. In Job chapter 1, verse 12, it says, And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on the person. God has granted Satan the power over Job in his life. And then we see that expressed and played out in verse 15. Verse 15 says, When the Sabaeans raided them and took them away, the oxen, indeed they killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Verse 17, While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels, took them away, and killed the servants. What's that tell you about Satan? He has control over armies of the world. God gave him control to be able to direct the Sabaeans and the Chaldeans at that time to attack Job. Could it be, and probably will be, that God will allow Satan to do the same thing with the armies of the world today? Absolutely, why not? What power that is to be able to control the armies of the world to do his will. Further on in Job, verse 16, look what it, it says. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. Think about that. The fire of God. Now, now they attributed it to God, but who's, God gave him permission. Satan has the power at this time to call down fire out of the heavens. Now what will that look like in the end times? I don't know, but we have a similar verse in the New Testament that says the same thing. This is real power. Real power that will be given to Satan. Look at verse 19. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house and fell on the young people and they are dead. God's allowing Satan to control nature. The winds of the earth at that time are under his control to do the will of the evil one. So this power that God is granting and allowing the Antichrist to have according to the power of Satan is a power to be reckoned with that will cause great harm, but it'll be supernatural power to do things that we don't have never seen. We have never seen anybody call fire down from heaven. We have never seen anyone control the winds to inflict punishment. Further on in Job chapter 2, it's verse 7, it says that he inflicted Job with painful sores and boils on his skin. So much he sat in the dust and scraped it off. He has the power to go after even God's Righteous, as it says, righteous people. The power to inflict physical pain, even upon, even upon those of the planet Earth. So don't discount the power that Satan will have at this time under the authority and permission of God himself. It's part of the judgment of God on mankind that rejects him. Continuing on in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he comes with all power. He comes with signs. He comes with signs. These signs point to something as the object or the person or a person of interest. He will come with signs that point to that will point to himself and demonstrate who he is. These signs will declare who he is and the world will know who he is. You're talking about the Antichrist. The Antichrist. We will know who he is because of the things that he does, the things that he says, the things that he represents, the power that he has. These will all point towards him as being the Antichrist, the lawless 
one, the one according to Satan. Signs have been used in the past. Jesus Christ, John was filled with signs that pointed to Christ as the Savior. If you remember, John the Baptist asked, sent somebody to Christ and said, are you the one we're looking for? Well, Jesus Christ went on to point to the signs that he was doing. The lame leap, the blind see, the deaf hear. He pointed to signs. Well, that will be similar to what's going to happen, except Satan will also be pointing to himself through the lawless one as to who he is. It also says lying wonders there in that verse 9. All power, signs, and lying wonders. The wonders will be real. They won't be false. They'll be real wonders by real power. But they'll point to something other than God. They will be pointing to lies, to false teaching. Similar to signs, they will exhibit who he is, these wonders. I want to bring you to Revelation chapter 13, where it's explaining the beast. And I want to show you some of these signs as it's explained here through the apostle. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads, verse 3, as if it had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed. A wonder, a power, a marvel. Theologians have debated what that actually means. Does he actually die and come back to life? Does he appear to be dead and telling people he came back to life? We will know when we see it. But I want you to see what the world's reaction to that is. Look at what the reaction is, verse 4. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? The world marvels. It's astonished by what happens to the beast, to the Antichrist, and how he is healed. Something real, something powerful, something supernatural. If you would, look at verse 13. Here we have the false prophet who's working on behalf of the Antichrist, the beast, the lawless one. Go to verse 13. He performs great signs so that it even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Does that sound familiar? So we'll see that fire in some form, shape, or way. Verse 14, and he deceives those who dwell in the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell in the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. There's a lot in that passage. I'm not going to go into depth as to what it all is, but we see things like the fire coming down from heaven. He was granted the power to be able to do this. There was an image made. Now, what is this image? We're not told what this image is. We can come up with various scenarios that might fit. First thought to me is we have some sort of artificial intelligence going on here, which is going at a rapid pace in our world today. But this image will be granted the guaranteed power and it will be speaking and it will cause worship of the beast. These are powerful signs that as believers we will not be able to mistake them. We will know as believers what is going on in this world. The world will be deceived. Revelation 13, 8, all who dwell on the earth will worship him. And the term dwell on the earth is specifically related to the unsaved people of the world, unbelievers. All who dwell on the earth, that term is not used of believers. 
those who make their home on planet Earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The world will follow him. It'll go after him. They will see his power. They will see his signs. They will believe what the, what the Antichrist is saying. And they will follow after him with all miraculous and supernatural signs. Believers should not be deceived. Revelation, or excuse me, Matthew 24, 24. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive if possible, even the elect or the saved. The saved should know who he is. Should not be any doubt who Satan is. We, we will not be surprised when we see these great signs and wonders put forth by the great deceiver, by the Antichrist. Look for them, see them. Deuteronomy chapter 13 is a, a great passage that I could reference, and I will. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 13 of Deuteronomy, it says this. It's, it's a place where they show you a test. A test of what a real prophet is or a false prophet is. How, how can we know? 13.1 says, If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder... And the sign or the wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Those words couldn't mean any more in the New Testament when the Antichrist comes up because the one thing the Antichrist will do, he will do lying wonders, he will do signs, it will come with all power, but he will not attribute anything to the Lord God Almighty or to Jesus Christ. He will point to himself as God as he sits in the temple and the Bible says, do not believe him when that happens. So believers should not be deceived when they see this. We are forewarned. We have been taught. But it will take great discernment because it says, if possible. Those words mean that it's going to be a very good imitation. And he's going to make every attempt to deceive us. He'll have the whole world going after them, all the unbelievers. And I pray that we will, as a body of Christ, be well aware of what's going on. This, so there will be a man who will come on the scene. He will be doing Satan's work with incredible and supernatural power, with the intent to deceive the world. He will pull in the military powers of the world. He will have all power given to him by Satan and allowed by God. He will be the ultimate narcissist. It will be all about him and drawing people to himself and away from God. Believers, don't be fooled. We have been warned, but we will need great discernment. I want to bring you to a passage in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 through 14. I think this is a very important passage because here it speaks about spiritual maturity and as we look in our world today we see nothing but light fluff being taught in our churches they will be so unprepared for the deception I, I almost wonder if they will be deceived the Antichrist comes on the scene and they won't know any better because they haven't been taught any better Look at verse 12 of chapter 5 in Hebrews. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled 
in the word of righteousness, or he's a babe. I think a lot of our churches are nothing more than nurseries filled with children, having their ears tickled, being entertained, being taught nothing of the deep oracles and word of God, teaching them. Look at verse 14. I'll put it up on the PowerPoint. Verse 14, but solid food. This is, this is where we get into the meat. And, and I pray that Zion's hope feeds nothing but solid food to the people not only here, but the people that watch the videos, that it's solid food you sink your teeth into. We go beyond. It's important that we know who Jesus Christ is. Yes, it's important that we hold the Lord God, but it's important that we know as much as we can because we have the Word of God sitting in your laps and in front of us. Let us teach and commit ourselves to that. Solid food belongs to those who are full age, speaking of maturity. That is, those who by reason of use... Don't I underline that for a reason. Because we are to use what we learn repeatedly. Practice it. Have it ingrained in who we are. Because as we do that, look what it says, they have their senses exercised, like working out, like working out in a gym. Why? To discern both good and evil. How important that will be when the Antichrist comes on the scene to deceive the world. We pray here at Zion's Hope that we are equipping people to be able to do this so that nobody is deceived and unprepared. Going back to now to 2 Thessalonians, still in verse 9, I, I, I want to just point something out here. <clears throat> Look at the end of verse 9. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. As believers, we could easily scoot by that highlighted part and not understand completely the significance and the passion that Paul has. Paul has used that verse. He uses perish to label unbelievers also in 2 Corinthians. Corinthians. But he's labeling unbelievers as those who perish. Do you understand that the people, most of the world you walk by, drive by, talk to, they're perishing. What's what perish means to be lost, ruined, destroyed. One commentator said to devote or give over to eternal misery in hell. Do we look at unbelievers like that? Satan's coming for them. He wants them. He wants to seal their fate. Satan does not like anybody. He loves himself. He places himself as God over them. I call them the walking dead. Walking dead. Why? Because those who perish are alive today walking the streets, even here in Winter Garden. And they don't even know it. And we need to take every opportunity to talk to them passionately. Let me ask you this. What would you give to reach another soul? that is perishing and facing eternal damnation? Would you give money? Would you give your time? I heard someone on the radio explaining about this woman who was raped and used that as an opportunity to evangelize a rapist. I thought about that and I said, wow, wow. What conviction. And that rapist, guess what? Gave his life to Christ. She understood the perishing, the passion she had for that person. I pray that all of us could have that passion and look beyond what we see and understand their eternal destiny. Why do they perish? Well, it tells us there in verse 10, because they do not receive the love of the truth that they might not be saved. They're rejecting it. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. They reject that love. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We see it at football games, big signs, John 3.16. Sometimes we tend to just trivialize that verse, but it's important. We should take it to heart and continue to preach it. But those who perish reject it. They say, no, it's not for me. I don't want any of that stuff. Keep it to yourself. But we keep going because we love people. Come to verse 11, and here's where it gets a little, a lot of people struggle with this. Verse 11 and 12. For this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. People struggle with this because here we see God's divine judgment being played out. Being played out for this reason. What reason? Because they rejected him. Judgment can come upon people who are alive and walking in this world today. Judgment will come eternally at the white throne for unbelievers, for those who are perishing. But God may seal their fate while they're still alive here on earth. That's what this says. For this reason, God will send them a strong delusion. They are still alive in the end time. They are walking the planet that they should believe a lie. God is what I call permanently hardening an already hardened heart. God does not delight in condemning and perishing those. He's, it's Bible says he's unwilling. But their failure to accept the truth, his love, may lead to a divine response here while they're still alive on planet Earth. But you have to understand, God is giving them exactly what they want. They are choosing. People God send sends people to hell, yes, but it's what they wanted. It's what they have hardened their heart against. It's their rejection of him. Sometimes God does permanently harden the heart. We have seen examples of that. And maybe many of you are thinking of the Pharaoh in the Exodus. There are 13 verses that talk about a hardened heart in the Exodus. The first group of them says the Pharaoh hardened his heart. The Pharaoh hardened his heart. The heart of the Pharaoh grew hard. But if you look at the last group, those in the latter chapters, chapters 10, 11, God now has hardening the heart. What's happening? God is sealing his heart. It's like he says, okay, I've given you one chance after another to show you who I am. And you have rejected me to the point that you have already hardened your own heart against me. And thus God hardens his heart while he's still alive. Condemns him, judges him right there. And that, that will be the case in the end times when people harden their hearts against God. Romans chapter 1, verse 24, 26, 28. We see a phrase called, and God gave them over. And God gave them over to the desires. Here we see that God is hardening their hearts. Why? Because they are chasing after the things that are sinful, that are evil, and that God has condemned and God has reached to them. You have no excuse. I've showed you who I am. Yet you go after the things of the world. You go after the unrighteousness, the deceitfulness that the world can offer. There's a point in time. And this is why it's a scary verse. I've always heard people say, well, we always have till I have that last breath before I can be saved. That's not true. That's not true, not according to these verses. You may. I'm not saying that every person is going to have their 
fate sealed before they die. I will say their fate is sealed when they die. But their fate may be sealed. If you have hardened your heart so strongly against God, and God only knows where that point in time is, then you may be sealing your fate right now that you may never turn. For my point of view from evangelism, I can't tell if that's happened, can you? So we preach and we tell whomever, whoever. I don't care how much they reject God. We need to speak to them again and again and do our part, but we're not God. We're not going to unharden a hardened heart. But God at this time in 2 Thessalonians says he's going to send a strong delusion, a strong deception in, in some versions of the Bible. Now this is not a new concept. We go all the way back to Isaiah chapter 6 where he's preaching to a sinful nation. God calls him into the throne room, gives him a vision of his glory, his holiness. And he says, Isaiah, I got a mission for you. Go speak to the people. And he said, go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their hearts and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. God knew the nation of Israel had rejected him time and time and time again and had hardened their heart and he knew that it was time for judgment and they were going to be cast into exile as a nation. It was time. And this happens throughout scripture over and over again. John chapter 12 this verse is quoted towards the Pharisees, towards the crowd. They're rejecting him at his first coming. In Acts chapter 28, before the Acts of the Apostle closes, Paul quotes it to those Jews while he's there in Rome who are rejecting the gospel. He's pronouncing judgment on their hard heart. And again, we see it in Romans chapter 11. And then we see it here, not quoted in 2 Thessalonians, but played out when God sends that delusion, that deception upon him. Because the world, the world at this point, has rejected God Almighty. And it says in 2 Thessalonians, God sends this strong delusion, deception, that they should believe the lie. What's the lie? Theologians debated, what's the lie that they're believing? Are they believing the lie of unrighteousness, of sin, and perhaps? But I think I gave it to you there, what I believe it is, it's verse 4. He sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Satan, through the Antichrist, is proclaiming himself to be God and the world is believing it. Amen. They are following the lie that he has propagated. He has wanted to be God from the day we can see in Scripture. And now he has the opportunity on planet Earth to declare that desire in the world of unbelief, those perishing, are going to say amen and we will worship you. What a sad day. The consequence is they will be condemned. Their judgment is sealed because they didn't believe the truth of who God really is. I mean, this, this is blasphemy. Blasphemy to worship a man who proclaims himself to be God. This, this, you want an example of the unpardonable sin? Here it is. They are condemned by God because of what they are doing. And the consequence is condemnation. The people alive at that time are living under a death sentence. And they don't even know it. Just as many are today. And that should drive us to speak to our friends and neighbors and loved ones. Instead, they had pleasure in unrighteousness. 
I don't want the truth of God. Too restricting. Too many commands. Too many thou shalts. It's all about rules. We know that's not true. It's all about the heart. But they're going to choose unrighteousness, evil, sin. We see it today. It'll explode in the future under him. The love of the world will be too much, and they will go after it. I want to come to a passage, and I want to close with this passage in Psalm 52, verses 1 through 5. Psalm 52, 1 through 5. Because I think it clearly shows us the world we live in today. The world we live in today. And it says it's a contemplation of David as he's thinking about his world. But as I read this, I thought about our world, my world. I thought about the world that will be when the Antichrist reveals himself and the world follows after him. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 52. Why do you boast in evil, O mighty man? Does that sound like our world? The goodness of God endures continually. Your tongue devises destruction like a sharp razor working deceitfully. You love evil more than good. Lying rather than speaking righteousness. You love all devouring worlds, you deceitful tongue. God shall likewise destroy you forever. He shall take you away and pluck you out of your dwelling place and uproot you from the land of the living. Strong words. But as I read through that and thought about that like David did, boy, that's our world today. Yes, he comes up with some strong words there in in verse 5, destruction, perishing. Perishing, as Thessalonians says. Our world doesn't believe the truth. They believe the lie. They believe lies. And they reject the word of God. It's a picture of our world. Be prepared for the Antichrist. And all deception will come upon us. Be watchful. Use these times for opportunities to speak to people about Christ, whether they believe you or not. But first and foremost, be saved. Be saved. Be sure. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the warning. We thank you for the preparation. We thank you for the discernment that you were imparting upon us. We thank you most of all for Jesus Christ. Thank you for what he did on the cross. Thank you for his work, for his example. Now, Lord, empower us through the power of the Spirit to go out into an unsaved world that is perishing and speak the word of truth. Out of love for you, we do that through Christ our Lord. Amen. Go deeper in your understanding of God, His people, and His plan for planet Earth. Zion's Fire magazine is an exceptional resource with powerful insights from Scripture that provide a clear understanding of God's ultimate plan for the last days and the return of Jesus Christ. As a first-time subscriber, you'll receive a free one-year subscription to Zion's Fire magazine with no strings attached. Request your free subscription by visiting our website or by calling our toll-free number and we'll send you six free issues, one every other month, for a full year. We depend on the generosity of viewers like you to support the ongoing production of these programs. Your donation, whether large or small, is greatly appreciated. Donations may be given online at www.zionshope.org or by calling us toll-free at 1-888-781-9466.
Stay informed and see the latest from Zion's Hope by liking us on Facebook, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and following us on Twitter.